I'd like to bid you all good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I finish my breakfast while you have your dinner. I've had a great time here for four weeks. That's what they tell me. You can run to 6,000 places in this town and never remember what the hell you saw when you got home. Boy, it's a buzzsaw up here. Hmm. Oh, that's good. It's really tea and honey is all it is. I thought one night they might surprise me once in four weeks and put a little booze in there. And Jack and Trotter is an innkeeper, you know. He's a caretaker, mother hen. Hey, Frank, don't hurt yourself now. Just keep quiet. Play more. <laughs> the Stone Age man of 1966. Uh, I do hope that you're enjoying yourselves here in Las Vegas, ladies and gentlemen, that if you have been gaming, you've been fortunate, more than I have. Uh, we've had a few moments of luck, but I'll get him yet. Famous last words, right? I'll get him yet. Then you go on the highway. And uh, we uh, are in our last week. This is the uh, final, the fourth week. I've been enjoying the stay. It's the longest time, actually, I've ever been in, uh, at the Sands and forth. First of all, I haven't worked here in a year, so I thought we ought to really do it up right. However, I took Mondays off. You see, we made a, a little situation here, so I, I had things to do on Monday nights. Mm. And um, <laughs> because when you work, you do two shows a night and you, and you have to socialize and everything else, you go in training, you know. So consequently, on Mondays, you have to have a day off. Because when you go on training, you really go on training for this kind of thing. Because the read goes bad, see? And in, the, in those Mondays, the drunk was here. He filled in for me. He came in uh, last Monday. He doesn't know he was here yet, but we'll tell him. I'll tell him when I go home next Wednesday, see? When I get back to L.A., I'll tell him. People ask me every day in the week, does Dean really drink that much? Well, I'm here to tell you he's a drunken bum. But the sweetest drunken bum you'll ever know in your life. He is stoned more often than the United States embassies around the world. <laughs> you know the AA burned crosses on his lawn? Because <laughs> he's a detriment to their career? <laughs> Him and my other friend, Joey Lewis. That's why I lost three years out of my life. Another drinking guy. Joey Lewis once said to me at Touch Shores in New York, he said, this is true, he said, let's go over across town, we go to Tony Canzanieri's and have a drink with Tony. I said, he's been dead for four years. <laughs> he said, I knew, but the bartender's still there, so let's go over there. <laughs> That's what he said, it's an absolute swear to God truth. <laughs> I worked with Joey Lewis last year in the, at the Eden Rock in Miami, and the showtime came and he wasn't there, backstage. And neither was uh, Charlie Greenface or the drummer we brought along. I was in great shape. Everybody was missing. So we made a quick switch. I went on, Joe used to open first, and then he'd come off and I would go on, and we would do a two-piece affair together. So I went on first, and he came and he finished up. After the show, I said, where the hell were you, Joe? He said, I was out in a bar. I said, but the show was on. He said, but the bartender was lonely because all the people were in watching the show. <laughs> the kind of sweet fella he is, too. <laughs> he once told the greatest joke about me when they used to do the thin man jokes about me when I was a skinny kid. I don't mean that I'm fat, but I'm a little heavier than I used to be. And uh, he said that I wasn't always in show business. I was in the Copacabana, New York, one night, in the audience. He was working there, and he told this joke. He said, Frank Sinatra wasn't always in show business. He used to work in an olive factory because he was a skinny kid. And he used to crawl through the olives and the guy used to, with a pimento, and a guy used to follow him with a scissor and cut the pimento <laughs> off. How do you figure this kind of a mind out? <laughs> crawl through the olives with a pimento like this. <laughs> That's great humor, I must say. They're funny men. They're truly, truly funny men. Well, I suppose that you've heard or read that uh, in the past month I turned 50. 
Well, I'm here to tell you it's a dirty, stinking lie. It's a lie. My body may be 50, but I'm 28. So your calendar has nothing to do with it. I, um, I feel marvelous, except for my surgical corset slipping occasionally, <laughs> which holds it in a little bit. And when everybody leaves, it goes down like that again, you see? No, I haven't got that yet. But I was thinking of trying to find a tailor who used to make George Raft's pants for those movies years ago. Remember those pants he used to wear way up there? I may get me some of those. Not only wore high pants in those days. I think they were part of his tie or something. I did notice that there are some changes take place in your life when you get to be 50. Certain little changes happen here and there, you know what I mean? Not what you mean, but certain little changes. Like for myself, I have a, an uncontrollable urge for chicken soup. And I find myself ordering calves liver. I never ate calves liver. And I'm drinking tea out of a glass with the sugar here. This past week, I've been saying oi more times than I ever said it before in my life. And I bumped my bursitis in the shoulder. Oi, 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 oi. The knuckles hurt a little more. They're getting fat now, you see. The knees. But I suppose those changes happen. But I was a, uh, I was a skinny kid. I was a, I'm a Sagittarius. Sagittarian. Sagittarius. 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 Some kind of an Armenian anyway. No, no, I'm a Wapaho from Sicily. That's an Indian tribe that they have over there. Next door to the Nava Jews. And uh, I was born in New Jersey in 1915, December the 12th. And I had a normal childhood, four holes in my head, six scars on my face. Oh, you know, a typical lovely childhood in a slum area. We lived in an eight floor, eight story walk up. Didn't know we were gonna have uh, heat or light or food. Funny part is my folks had a lot of money. They just hated me. <laughs> they wouldn't pop for anything. And then of course I grew and uh, nearly got out of high school, almost. Prior to graduation, the principal called my father in for about the 700th time in three and a half years. And he said to him, Mr. Sinatra, Here's his diploma, get him out. Just remove him from the premises. Get him out. And uh, my dad and I walked out, and we stood on the steps of the high school, and he started to talk to me. You see, my father was a graduate of Rutgers, and he majored in English. And he said, well, what the hell are you gonna do now that they threw you out of the school? Huh? Wise guy? Go ahead, be a wise guy. You don't want to learn, huh? Majored in English. Elocution. He was the Lawrence Olivier of the Sicilians in my neighborhood. <laughs> well, I got around, I fooled around with a lot of jobs that I had. They didn't mean anything. Finally got singing business and uh, went to work with a quartet for Major Bowles. Those of you who are old enough to remember, he had a radio amateur hour, see? It was like the Ted Mack show, but it was on the radio. Matter of fact, Ted Mack used to work for Major Bowes. Major Bowes was an enormous man, 270 pounds with a big bulbous nose. He was a big drunk. He used to drink Green River and car stairs and all of that, oh, that fine rat duck that they used to have in those. Golden wedding. <laughs> Take the paint off your boat deck. I think I detect a little doubt in your laughter. <laughs> well, after that, I got a job with Harry James, and then I went with Tommy Dorsey, and then went out on my own, and oh, gee, I was such a smash, I couldn't stand myself like that. Oh, I was such a big hit. I made great movies. Johnny Concho, Miracle of the Bells, a kissing bandit, the worst bombs anybody was ever in. I don't know how the hell I ever managed to live, stay alive. The only one I missed was the one Dean was in a thousand and one bedrooms. Man, oh, what a turkey that was. <laughs> that was nearly as bad as Sammy's first television show. We can't figure out which is worse, you see. 
Go ahead, don't applaud that. That's too bad that it was bad, but it was bad. He knows it. We've been talking on the phone. Hey, the lines have been burning up every day. He wrote a book called Yes, I Can. I sent him a wire. No, you can't. <laughs> and if Mrs. Burton keeps making those kind of appearances on television, I'm going to have to get a wider screen of my goddamn set. They kept falling onto my floor in the living room. I kept pushing them back in. And I happened to like them. She may bring back mothers. I think I said a half a word that time. Well, now... Now we're gonna have some Rosarita tacos for everybody in the band. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't know what you want to call this as a public service or what have you, but I, I, at this point in the show, usually just remind you folks who are in here in Las Vegas that if you're gonna be around for a while, there are a lot of marvelous performers up and down the strip who would like working for you. So jump in and see them if you can, if you got the time. They got the show at the uh, Tropicana, the big Foley's Berger with the, the birds. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> I don't know how people can eat through the dinner show. It's very distracting to watch all that it does. That reminds me, I gotta get my kids some balloons tomorrow. I gotta <laughs> and in the lounge, you got Guy Lombardo and Helen O'Connell. And in the Flamingo is young Bobby Darren. And in their lounge, they got uh, Xavier Cougat and uh, Abby Lane. Oh, no, no, she's gone now, yeah. <laughs> She's gone, yeah. He switches Indians like Louis Prima does. <laughs> That's right, yeah. And uh, in our lounge, we got uh, little Betsy Duncan and uh, Gaylord and Taylor and the uh, Righteous Brothers. And uh, better known as Frickin' Frack. <laughs> well, there's another name, but I don't think I ought to use it right now. And down the street at the Desert Inn is the marvelous Phil Harris, Dr. Harris who makes the greatest hangover cure in the world. I don't know what the hell he puts in it, but it sure straightens me out all the time. And in their lounge, they got the counterpart of Guy Lombardo, Jan Garber. So if you got guts, you take your choice which one you want to hear. Between them, I think they could pay off the whole debt that we owe for the nation. That doesn't bother me. I got $800 in 15 different banks. What, are you kidding or something or what? And then down the street, who's next? The Riviera's Hello, Dolly. And in that lounge, you're going to get a thrill of your life you go down there and hear Sarah Vaughan, you're gonna fall on the floor. She's something else. Ah, damn, she's something else. <laughs> I was gonna throw in the towel the other night and quit singing completely when I heard this girl. And then further down at the Sahara is the, um, who's at the Sahara? Don't nobody know? The King Sisters. That's right, that joint's loaded with sisters, and in the lounge they got the DeCastro sisters, right? What is that, a nunnery or what they got down there? I'm not too sure about the DeCastro. I think they're three FBI guys, the three of the DeCastro sisters. I do. I'm gonna date them and find out. If you hear a loud scream, they're FBI guys. It won't be me screaming, they'll be screaming. Now, uh, if you wish to see something that you might like to take the kiddies to, you see Bell Barth or Hank Henry. <laughs> they do a PTA show. I'm trying to book them for early television, like 10 or 11 in the morning for everybody to see. And right here on this stage, I'd like to have you meet one of the bright young men in the composing business, Mr. Quincy Jones. My conductor. My conductor. Save the bones for Quincy Jones cause he don't eat no meat, he's a egg man. <laughs> and of course, there are no adjectives, so I merely say, ladies and gentlemen, the magnificent Count Basie and this great orchestra. I'd like you to meet my pianist, Mr. Bill Miller, who's sitting back here. You see, he doesn't do anything 
but I brought him along to break up the color scheme. <laughs> because uh, I don't want anybody to think that we're a group of anti-segregationists up here, you see. Or whatever, have, whatever you call that jazz. And I keep bailing out Dick Gregory and he gets locked up every time. <laughs> he just don't run fast enough, that's all, folks. Did you ever hear about the time Sammy Davis got in the bus in Birmingham and the guy said, get in the back? He said, I ain't colored, I'm Jewish. The guy said, get the hell off the bus. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to leave you a thought. And that is that I feel sorry for people who don't drink because when you get up in the morning, that's as good as you're gonna feel for the rest of the day, baby. <laughs> <laughs>